The North American Society for the Psychology of Sport and Physical Activity, NASPA, will celebrate its 50th anniversary in June of 2017. As part of the celebrations, it was decided that we would interview the previous distinguished scholars. My name is Penny McCullough, and today we will be chatting with Dr. Ronald Martinuk. Through 2016, NASPA has named 24 distinguished scholars. Dr. Martinuk was named a distinguished scholar in 2004. This interview is being conducted in February of 2017. Good afternoon, Dr. Martinuk. How are you today? I'm doing very well, Penny. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, first of all, please tell us a little bit about your academic background. Well, I'm Canadian, as, as you know, and uh, I was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I attended high school there, St. Mary's High School, a Catholic school. And then I moved on to the University of Alberta, which is also in Edmonton. And I took uh, my Bachelor of Physical Education there and my Master of Arts. Then uh, I uh, ended up with my going for my doctorate work, uh, getting an EDD uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. Okay, and uh, why did you decide to pursue a doctoral degree in physical education at the time, now kinesiology, and how did you decide what university you'd go to and who would be your mentor? Right, good question. Um, two of my professors at Alberta, both uh, at the undergraduate level and uh, the graduate level, um, Max Howell and Bob Morford, uh, were both students of Franklin Henry at Berkeley. So I learned a lot about Berkeley through them and uh, the approach that uh, uh, Franklin Henry there took. Uh, th so those two people were very influential in, in shaping my interest in a career in research and me having Henry as a mentor. Because of them, I applied only to Berkeley to study with Henry. I know I put all my eggs in one basket. A lot, a lot of my uh, colleagues at Alberta uh, applied to three or four different universities, and I felt so strongly about studying with Franklin Henry that I only applied to Berkeley, and, and very fortunately, I was accepted, uh, and I was really pleased about that. Oh, that's great. And what do you recall about your first exposure, interest, or involvement in research? How did you get involved uh, in the field? Yeah. As an undergraduate Alberta, I was fortunate. The, uh, the phys ed department there uh, uh, had some very good researchers, and I became familiar uh, with their research labs and some of the projects. And initially, it was through um, serving as a subject, and that, which I enjoyed because I learned a little bit about research. And then uh, I actually became involved in one or two small projects as, as an investigator. So that got me in, in, introduced to research and thinking about keeping involved in it. And so I decided um, to go on to graduate work at Alberta. And that just reinforced my interest uh, and my aspiration to do doctoral work, you know, given the influence that uh, Bob Morford and uh, Max Howell had on me. Right. And, and what do you would call your first exposure to research at Berkeley with Henry? Uh, can it, you think of anything was, striking? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, his big topic, of course, was, uh, you know, the theory of specificity. And uh, that was pretty much uh, uh, the main topic that, that we discussed, although I, at that time he also covered some exercise physiology with his graduate students, and we were all exposed to basic principles there. But by and large, uh, he was he was interested in the, the area of specificity and just how far that could be taken uh, in different kinds of tasks. Okay, and great. And then tell us about a, a little bit about your doctoral dissertation. What do you remember about that? <laughs> a little bit. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, as you might expect, it had to do with individual differences and uh, their specificity. But this time I took a little different tack at it. Uh, instead of looking at uh, individual differences within a task, I looked at um, whether there were reliable intra-individual differences, <laughs> intra very in, I'm sorry, intra-individual variability differences. In other words, uh, if a, a person on one task showed so much variability over different trials of the task, was that variability 
reliable, I, that is, are there individual differences, reliable individual differences if you look at a group of people. And then, of course, uh, the, the next question was, if there were reliable intra-individual variability differences, uh, were they specific? And I found evidence for both. Um, in other words, uh, if you took a group of individuals, their variability would be reliable, i.e. I different from each other, reliably different from each other. And then if you looked at their variability over different tasks, the, the variability was specific to a given task. Okay, so thank you. Wasn't I think groundbreaking. I, wasn't groundbreaking. I think I remember reading some of that, some of that data that you produced in, uh, in my graduate days. Yeah, that's right. I was... Uh, I was one of Burke, uh, Henry's first students to use uh, the, the um, computer to do analysis, and I couldn't have done it otherwise because looking at intra-individual variability, you have to have many trials, many individuals, and I remember uh, at that time, uh, you had to walk your data to uh, the main computer center at Berkeley <laughs> and then wait for three to four hours for a, a turnaround and if there was an error, you have to do it all over again. And uh, I had at one time a whole bookcase full of uh, <laughs> cards, computer cards that I and you, had to uh, had to create. And you hoped you didn't drop the cards on the way over. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember. I still have a few cards stacked on my shelf just to remember. <laughs> do you really? Wow. Yes, I do. I kept a few. <laughs> I burned mine a long time ago. <laughs> okay, Ron, your distinction of becoming a distinguished scholar of NASPA recognizes your long-standing contributions in the areas represented by your research. We would now like to have you share some of your thoughts in your scholarly endeavors. So tell us a little bit about what sort of research interests did you have early on? You kind of told us about that. And then did you continue to pursue this line? And if you changed your line, tell us a little bit about how that happened or why that happened. Right. Okay. Um, so when I was at Berkeley, um, although I had to uh, follow Henry's interest and so forth, I was very fortunate, and I and I took a class from E. R. F. W. Crossman, you know, the English researcher. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're very familiar yes. with his work. And. Uh, he was quite active at Berkeley. He's in the Department of Engineering. I, uh, I uh, signed up for the class, and I was the only person not an engineer in it. And the, the math sort of got to me at times. But he introduced me to an information processing approach to movement execution and learning. Uh, and this was the just this was developing uh, as I was at Berkeley, and I was quite enchanted by that approach. And the approach was reinforced by research articles by Steve Keel and Michael Posner at the University of Oregon and their work on short-term memory for movement. You probably remember some of those articles. Uh, yes, yes I do. And, uh, <laughs> Not well. <laughs> yeah, well they, they really impacted me. And also influenced me at that time was the classic book by Fitz and Posner on information processing and human performance. And in fact, um, Crossman in his class actually used that as a textbook. And uh, some of the engineers were quite mystified at the terminology because they were mostly uh, interested in, in doing mathematics of, uh, of movement and so forth. So. These works, Fitz and Posner and Crossman, and there, there were several others at that time too, uh, really got me interested in researching um, movement short-term memory, especially for mm -hmm. kinesthesis. And that was my first major uh, research topic. And it consumed my interest from the time I graduated from Berkeley and then at the University of British Columbia uh, for about five years, and then for several years after that when I moved to the University of Waterloo in Ontario. Uh, in fact, I was, take, I was so taken by the information approach, uh, processing approach uh, to understanding movement control and learning, I wrote a book in 1976 on information processing and movement. I have that the, book on my bookshelf. 
Do you really? Wow. I think, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I've lost all my copies a long time ago. <laughs> Maybe I better send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's good. Uh, anyway, um, I carried on in this area for quite a while. And uh, I, uh, I basically my my um, goal was to understand how people learn movement. And according to to the information processing approach, you had to understand uh, short term memory because that takes in information uh, initially and preserves it for a short time before it's passed on to long term memory. And so I thought if I could understand short-term memory, the principles of short-term memory, I might have some understanding of how that is passed on to long-term memory and then try uh, maybe understanding how people really do uh, learn movement tasks. Great. I had another question about research, but I think you pretty well encompassed it there. Um, so I'll move on to this. Tell us about a research project that you were particularly interested in, proud of, or feel you made an impact on the field. And was there some other researchers, and you kind of mentioned some of those already, that had a profound influence on you? Yeah, yeah. Well, th there's more to this story because uh, <laughs> while, while at the University of Waterloo, I became disenchanted with the short-term memory area, uh, <laughs> primarily because of the tasks being used to research the pro uh, this process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably remember most tasks were single joint movements performed yep. on an apparatus that severely restricted the movement. Mm -hmm. So many, many people studied movement around the elbow joint mm -hmm. and, and did their uh, research on that. So as a result, I, uh, along with Christine McKenzie, were instrumental at the University of Waterloo in developing a three-dimensional movement analysis system called the WetSmart. <laughs> that allowed us to study unrestricted movement. Um, this, the complexity of movement forced us to draw heavily on the analysis of biome biomechanical people uh, research uh, that these people used. Um, and during this time, we drew heavily on the works of researchers, especially uh, that of Marc Janeroux from France, mm -hmm. that were interested in studying reaching and grasping a human movement. So we published a lot in this area and I think made several important contributions. Certainly we understood a lot about how people, uh, when they're free to move uh, in any direction, uh, move uh, their arm and hand to, to grasp an object as one example. And the, the major process we used was one of um, doing a multi-joint movement and then perturbing part of that movement either visually or mechanically. And basically, we were trying to understand movement uh, coordination and how the system as a whole responded to perturbations. So these res these results, we hoped, would give us into insight into the structure of coordination and perhaps how coordination and movement is learned. Again, that being my major goal in my 40-some-odd years of doing research <laughs> in, in movement, uh, control and learning. Great. That was a, a nice synopsis, I think. Um, so, Ron, tell us a, a little bit about your involvement in NASA, and um, if you, you remember when you were named Distinguished Scholar, kind of what that meant to you. Well, uh, when I was at Berkeley, um, NASPA was just getting underway. I think it might have been a couple of years old, <clears throat> and I hadn't, I didn't attend it as a graduate student. But then when I um, moved to the University of British Columbia in Canada. I, uh, my very first year there, I started attending NASPA, and I very rarely missed that, uh, missed going to the national conference uh, uh, over, the, over the years that I, I was doing research. So I was a, a large supporter of, of uh, NASPA, and, and I uh, served on several committees and greatly enjoyed interacting with the people there. And I served, as you as you know, one year as its president, and was very honored to do so. 
That's good. That's great. Um, now it's uh, interesting. You 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 were a distinguished scholar of NASA, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this question. Of course, Franklin Henry was named the first distinguished scholar at NASA in 1981, and then yes. you, as a student, and a couple of his other students also were named distinguished scholar. Um, so he's had a pretty profound influence on the field, and of course he's not with us anymore. Do you care to just say a couple of words about um, Dr. Franklin Henry? Sure. He uh, he was probably the uh, I want to use the word strongest, but probably the most hardworking scientist uh, that I've ever uh, come across. He devoted his life, literally, to science in, in human movement and uh, exercise physiology too. He, he uh, had a number of really important publications in that area. He could be found uh, seven days a week in his office um, and he enjoyed interacting with the students. 10 o'clock every morning he'd come around to our offices and say let's go guys and we'd trot off behind him to the nearest cafeteria where he'd get coffee in a bun and then talk almost nonstop between bites telling us about science and his current interests and talking about you know the history of, of uh, movement control and the people in it um, and as you know he, he's he was very very well published and very well respected so and he had a big impact on um, the development of the field so I I am all my work in getting, trying to get to Berkeley really paid off. He, he really influenced me from a, uh, a scientific viewpoint. He gave me something to guide me through um, uh, being a scientist. Okay. Well, it looks like he did. It. He looks like he did a pretty good job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, I don't have any other questions to ask you specifically. Is there anything you want to add, or you feel as though you left out? No, I think that's it, Penny. I've, as you know, as you know, I prepared a little bit for this uh, for this questionnaire, and I've really enjoyed it. Okay. Many memories. <laughs> that that's great, and we really thank you for taking this time to do it, and because I think it's it's part of our history and an important part of our history, and the st distinguished scholars have made such a contribution, and it will be nice for um, other people that never got the ch opportunity to meet you or young scholars to have a listen and, and see some of the ideas that you worked on over the years. Good. So I want to thank you. Thank you so much for your time, yeah. and have a wonderful 2017. And I hope maybe we could see you at NASPA. <laughs> okay. Take care. We'll do that. Yeah. Thank you very thank much, you. Penny. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.